Hello, this is On The Ledge and I'm Jane Perrone. This week, we're going to be turning your plant photography from rank to ranking. I'll be talking to three plant photographers who are going to offer up all their best tips for taking really good photos of your plants. So, whether you've got a snazzy DSLR or just your smartphone, we'll figure out how to get the very best shots of your plants, whether just for your own records or to show off on Instagram. And I've got a question about a philodendron pink princess that's really letting down its name because, quite frankly, it's not very pink. Thanks to everyone who's been splashing out on some On The Ledge merchandise. Your merch should be winging its way to you now if you haven't received it already. And when they do, please stick up a nice little picture of what you got and tell me what you think. I'd really love to hear your feedback about the merch if you have invested in some. I really want to make sure that you're happy with it. And if you have any suggestions for changes or additions to the range, then do let me know. This week's episode is all about how to take better photos of your plants. There might be many reasons for doing this. You might be taking photos just as record keeping because after all, it's really interesting to see how your plants grow over the season. And it's easy to forget how those tiny plants start out and how big they grow. But you might also be wanting to share pictures of your charges with social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. Or you might even be using your plants as inspiration for artwork, crafts or some other kind of artistic activity. Whatever your reason, taking good houseplant pictures is a skill that we can all learn, but it doesn't necessarily come naturally. Despite how easy it is just to point and click these days, I know a lot of my photographs end up looking well decidedly average. So I tapped the brains of three plant photographers to find out some top tips on how to make your photos look their absolute best. Much of what I do know about plant photography, I learned from British photographer Jackie Hurst. Jackie is an award-winning British photographer who specialises in gardens and plants, applied arts, crafts and artisan foods. And she runs lots of photography workshops. So she's used to talking to people like you and me who are really just starting to get to grips with our cameras and smartphones. One of the best tips she taught me was how to frame a photo without letting those odd stray items ruin your shot. The mantra is less is more. First of all, I would say be drawn to your subject as a spontaneous reaction. And then as you compose your picture and start framing it, always look around the edge of the frame because... Sometimes you can get so engrossed in a single plant that you don't see the bigger picture and you can find that there are lots of distracting objects in the background. If need be, declutter, take odd bits of, you know, bits and bobs that you might have or perhaps if you've got five plants, it might look better with just four plants so you can see them properly. But also ensure that the background complements the plants have something neutral or if the plants lead to it you know have a colored background or something more jazzy but make sure that it doesn't dominate because sometimes the viewer will not know where they're meant to look and what you've got to ask yourself is what does this picture say to me and what do I want to say to the viewer and if it doesn't say anything to you just try recomposing rethink My next expert is Philippa Dominguez, who lives in Cape Town in South Africa. By day, she's a film producer, but she also has a sideline in taking stunning pictures of cacti and succulents. And what's wonderful about her Instagram feed, Check My Plants, is quite how different it looks to anyone else's. That's because she photographs all her plants on a black background. Here she explains how that came about. I I started collecting uh, a lot of succulents, um, and someone and I, I real before I knew it, my collection was quite large, but I didn't know anything about my plants. And one day I had a friend come visit 
come visit me. And he said, wow, you should post a picture every day of your plants. And I just thought, who's got time for that? Uh, and I, I just didn't have time. It was, it was in the December holidays, though. And then a couple of days later, I was just sitting on the couch and I just thought, mm, you know, maybe let me give it a bash. And uh, I'm actually a film producer. Uh, my, that's my, my main profession. My photography is actually just a hobby. And I had done a film shoot uh, like a couple of years back, which everything was on black, where we had to blend everything on black. And we got we had this very special black cloth. And it just happened to be in my cupboard. And I had seen it a couple of days before. So I quickly whipped that out and I put my first plant on there. And I just thought, wow, this looks really cool. And then I, that's where it started, and, it, and I haven't been able to stop since. I, every single time I put a plant in there and I just go, wow, it looks even better than it does. <laughs> I don't know. It just makes it so much more striking. Um, yeah, and I loved it. So I've just decided to stick to that. And, I, yeah, so I guess the moment I did the very first photo, I decided, okay, if I am going to photograph this plant, I'm going stick to stick to a uniform look and stick to it all on black. Do go and take a look at Check My Plants on Instagram while you're listening because Philippa's account really is stunning. You really do see the wow factor of cacti and succulents. And here's Philippa explaining how she frames a shot. When, for me, when I look at a plant and it blows my mind, most of the time plants are blowing my mind, I just try and... I try and frame it up the way I first saw it. So often I'll actually just put my, I mean, I'll have it in there and I'll move the camera all around until I find the spot that that was the spot that made me go, wow. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. So it's, 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 it's important to keep the framing in mind just, um, so to make sure it's centered, to make sure that the angle is correct, even moving the plant around to the right angle. Um, I mean, and I try not to overthink it, to be quite honest, because I just I put it down and I try and 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 do it in the initial first, this is what grabbed me, this is how I saw it, and this is how it grabbed me, and that's why I have to try. Um, that was actually why I started. I was like, I, I want people to see what I'm seeing. I can't believe I've wandered this earth for like 35 years and I only got into plants in the last two, three years. I was like, where have these, where have my eyeballs been all these years? Um, focusing on the wrong things. And now I see all these plants and I just wanted people to see the way I see it. And I thought of, it would hopefully inspire other people to like plants more. <laughs> And my final photography expert is Marjana from Folia Folia, the Instagram account based in Vienna that brings us beautiful pictures of all kinds of plant foliage, greenhouses and other lush delights. Now, when it comes to taking pictures of your house plants, it's not quite as easy as working in a greenhouse where the light tends to be much more even and better for those plant snaps. So what do you do when you're shooting inside? Well, I'm glad to say that my trio of photographers had several solutions to this problem. First up, it's Marjana of Folia Folia. It's always good to move close to the window. It's good to move to the balcony if somebody has one. And uh, also, also outside, it's good to go outside and especially on the day, which is um, when the sky is a bit cloudy, it, uh, it helps. Um, not too strong shadows, not too strong, uh, not too strong uh, contrasts. Yeah, that uh, should work. I think uh, it's not, I, I don't, uh, um, I don't like to, uh, modify the colors or of the photo in a post production because I think it's I want to show the plan how it actually is. I want to keep it as uh, realistic as possible. If moving your plants isn't an option, then Jackie Hurst has another suggestion. To make the best of light, a lot of plants are quite not necessarily in the window but near the window. Um, so you will have light coming in, but indoor light is never as bright as outside. Um, you can use a reflector, which you can make. You can either buy them from camera equipment shops or you can make them. Now, I personally make a reflector out of what they call foam board, but you could make it out of thick card. And I have three bits of board that I tape together and then I can fold flat when I'm not using it and tuck it under a sofa or wherever and it's freestanding so 
it means that I can stand the reflector further on the opposite side of the light source to bounce it back onto the house plants. It just softens the shadows and it evens out the contrast, which is a great help. If you don't fancy getting all DIY on this, you could also try using a mirror. Although Jackie, the seasoned professional, reminded me that the problem with this is a heavy mirror falling on your plants or even worse on a hard floor can be disastrous. If you can't quite picture what Jackie's describing, then do check out the show notes where you can see a picture of Jackie's homemade reflector. The trouble with light and photography is it's a bit of a Goldilocks porridge moment. Too little and your photograph won't come out very nicely, but too much and the shadows will be too harsh. Here's Philippa on the issues surrounding sunlight and photography. Just be aware of the lighting because sometimes the there'll be shadows and you don't want uh, like across your, your plant or so make sure there's some good lighting. Sometimes direct uh, sunlight is, is a bit, is a bit too harsh. I find mine. So I don't do any of mine in the direct sunlight. I actually kind of have it. Um, it like it's almost sits in the shadow. That's why it needs to have, it needs to be full sunlight so that like even in the shadow it's perfectly you can still see everything um because yeah the, the, sometimes the direct light for me is just just a bit too harsh you know and then you need a bit of a softness um so there, there's that so it's just be aware of of the lighting um so sometimes i found if i take a photo even if it's not on black uh, in the direct sunlight i have to actually just go and quickly find some shade and take a photo of it in the shade and it's a completely different thing you know once you've got the light right, it's a question of trying to get your image into a nice sharp focus. And this is where I find myself wobbling about all over the place. Now, Philippa, who takes all of her photos on an iPhone using only natural light, is used to dealing with this problem. First of all, it's you can't have it too close. So it's better to, I, I never zoom in on the actual photo or while I'm taking the photo. So you t sometimes you have to have it just a little bit further away. And then, and, and I, I only edit all my stuff on Instagram. I try my best to not bring it into Photoshop or onto my laptop. Um, so 99% of the time I'm, I'm successful that way. So, but um, the, the thing is, is there's a close focus to most cameras and this, the, the, the iPhone lens can, it can get relatively close, which is what's great about it, which is, what's great about photographing small plants uh, but you do need to have a certain distance and then perhaps zoom in afterwards um once it's already on your phone and then you'll get the f it's, it's easier to focus that way but there, there needs to be a lot of light also and obviously try not move the phone a lot try keep still so sometimes if i've had a bit of wine the night before it's quite hard to take a photo the next day but it's worse than that. Even if you haven't had a glass of wine the night before, focusing when you're snapping pictures indoors can be difficult, as Jackie explains. You're photographing indoors, so you don't have much light, so you're going to have slow shutter speed. If you're on auto, a flash will pop up that you may not want, so I'd say turn it off. But if you're not, and your camera allows you to take it, you might have such a slow sh shutter speed that you can't hold the camera steady. It's called camera shake. So that's when a little tripod comes in handy. When it comes to tripods, there are numerous options out there, but Jackie recommends the Gorilla Pod, which is a flexible tripod that you can use to wrap around things and place on a table. It's a really flexible thing. And there are various other similar designs out there. So do shop around and find something that works for you. Let's take a break from our snapper chat to have a look at the question of the week, which comes from Mary Clancy. Mary dropped me a line to on the ledge podcast at gmail.com because she's worried about her pink princess philodendron. First of all, Mary, you have the envy of many of us because I know that here in the UK, pink princess is still incredibly hard to get hold of. So well done for having a plant. But it's not all good news because Mary's pink princess is anything but pink. This was a plant she got hold of a couple of years ago, but she tells me that now it's producing mostly dark green leaves with barely any pink. And she's wondering if there are some ways to increase the variegation on the leaves. She says it's always been close to a bright window and has been very happy, just not pink. Well, 
Uh, the more I dug into this, the more interesting stuff I found out. So I'm really glad to share with you my Pink Princess plant notes. Pink Princess is a cultivar of philodendron erubescence or the blushing philodendron which has dark red leaves. Now the dark red colour that's caused by the presence of anthocyanins which are a kind of reddish pigment and that's what gives the leaves their colour. It's worth remembering why and how plants are variegated in the first place. There are actually several different types of plant variegation and several causes. I'm going to link in the show notes to a brilliant piece by Pistols Nursery in the US called Variegated Indoor Plants, the science behind the latest house plant trend. This has a really nice summary of all the different reasons why plant leaves can be variegated. And it's really worth going to give that a read if you want to understand the plant variegation that you have in your collection. But the first thing to say about this particular plant, the Pink Princess, is it has what's called chimeral variegation. You may remember this if you're an avid listener. Last year when I interviewed Robbie Blackhall Miles for the Bathroom Plants episode, he was talking about this and the fact that he's not that keen on variegation for this very reason. What's chimeral variegation? It basically means that your plant is a bit of a genetic mutant. There's a battle going on in them, their leaves, and it's caused by two different genetic recipes, which are basically battling each other within the leaf. So one cell might have a genome that includes chlorophyll. The cell next door might not. So therefore you get green splotches and you get pale splotches. If you read the Pistols Nursery piece, you'll see there are other reasons why plants become variegated. In the case of Pink Princess, This is a chimeral variegation. So this gives us a hint as to why some plants revert, which basically means they go back to being all one colour. This can work both ways. Some people find that their pink princesses end up with all pink leaves. Obviously, this isn't great because that means there's absolutely no chlorophyll in that leaf. But others find that the plant will just revert to being dark red without the pink splotches. Why does this happen? Well, there can be many different reasons why a plant reverts. Chimeral variegation is by its nature unstable. There's a battle going on between those two sets of genes at all times. So you do find that sometimes this reversion will occur and you might not be able to put your finger on exactly why. It's pretty hard to pin down exactly what's going on. But having searched around, it does look like Pink's Princess is particularly prone to reverting. I came across an interview with Justin Hancock of the plant producer Costa Farms, a really big house plant producer in the US. And he specifically mentioned Pink Princess as a plant that they had rejected as a plant for mass production because it just didn't pass their tests. And the piece says, we found they have a too high reversion rate if we propagate 10,000 and only 8,000 keep their variegation. The sad truth is that we can't afford to grow them. So this does seem to be a particularly unstable variegation. If you go around searching for a pink princess mail order, you may find that you're looking at reverted plants which are being advertised as such for sale. So clearly this is a problem that lots of people encounter. There are various tips on how to get your plant to go back to being variegated, including cutting off some of the stem in a bid to get it to produce new foliage that's more variegated. But it just seems that some plants just prefer to go back to their single colour leaf and there's not a whole lot that you can do about it. Oh, and just to say, if any of your variegated plants do start putting out entirely white leaves then that is also something to be keeping an eye on because a plant that has totally white leaves as you will imagine is not able to photosynthesize and leaving those leaves on the plant will gradually weaken it i had this experience with a hoya carnosa a wax plant which started putting out white leaves and i thought oh they're so pretty i'm going to keep them and you know what that plant was nearly dead within a few months so if you do find your plants putting out all white leaves then do think about chopping those out and encouraging the plant to start variegating its leaves again because that really is a lot more dangerous than the plant just going to plain green. So Mary I think my advice to you would be if you're concerned about this lack of variegation have a chop away at your plant. Maybe wait until the spring if you're in the northern hemisphere but cut it back, cut back the main stem back to just above a leaf node and you can always propagate that 
bit of stem as well if you fancy and see what happens it may well get your plant back on track with variegation it may not but do let us know how you get on and thank you to the houseplant fans of on the ledge group who helped me with some links to research this topic if you've got a pink princess philodendron that's decidedly not pink do let me know or if you have any tips or tricks for dealing with reversion also let's be having that info the email address here at On The Ledge is ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. It really is the best way of getting in touch with me. You can also drop me a line on Instagram where I'm j.l.perone or tweet me at Jane Perone. I don't know about you, but I find it's very easy to fall into what I call white room syndrome. What this means is you spend a lot of time scrolling through Instagram looking at gorgeous plant accounts. And everyone seems to have a white minimalist room with beautiful plants hanging all over the place. And it just feels like that's what you need to do to make your plants look good. But of course, not all of us have white minimalist rooms available to photograph our plants in. I certainly don't. So I wanted to find out from our experts, Philippa, Jackie and Marjana, how to put your own personal stamp on your plant photos. When I spoke to Philippa, we chatted about photographing many different plants, including cannabis sativa. If you're a Patreon subscriber of $5 a month or more, you can hear the whole interview with Philippa now over on my Patreon feed. And there's information in my show notes on how to sign up for that. For Philippa, looking at a cannabis leaf in a new way opened up a new perspective on a very familiar and indeed notorious plant. No one sees the world the way you see it. Everyone sees it in their own particular way, and that is what photography is. You are showing people the way you are seeing, um, and that's so that that yellow uh, ganja leaf that's a bit further down there, the marijuana leaf. Uh, at first, you know, it fell down, and I just put it there to the side, and I was like, "Oh no, it's it's just a small little dead leaf." I'm just, and then I looked at it again, and I was like, "No, but this is actually really beautiful. Even it's not your typical perfect green." leaf but it's still the color is beautiful something's totally different about it i'm going to photograph it and then wow it came out so beautifully i was like this is great but so it's it's important to recognize what you what you instantly grabs your attention and how you see it um i I don't know if if that makes any sense it's worth remembering that there are reasons why so many plant photographs take place against a white background and that's because well it's a lot easier to make a good plant photo that way. But sometimes it's good to move out of our comfort zone, as Jackie Hurst explains. We have got a bit seduced into minimal declutter. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, but it works. So we're playing safe. And I think that if you can try using different backgrounds, try even using... If you say want to shoot your plant, house plants against a window, then you must experiment using different exposures. Because if you want the house plants correctly exposed, then you're going to have to overexpose and allow the the background to bleach out, which is very trendy in photographs at the moment. And I think it's lovely because it gives it an, a nice airy feel. You can either do it depending on the type of camera you have. You can, if you're working on a tripod, you can take a meter reading from the actual house plant or the container, which will probably be in shadow. You can, and then recompose your picture. Lock this, but recompose and take the picture like that to get the right exposure. Or lots of cameras have something called exposure compensation. And you, you can go take it on what the camera says is normal and then move it to plus a third and it goes from normal right up to plus three. And every time you move it one notch, makes it a bit lighter, a bit lighter, a bit lighter, which lightens the shadows and the highlights, or you go minus. 
occurred and it makes it darker. Now, not every camera has it. If you're using a smartphone and you press on the pitch, you just tap the screen, some of them have a little um, square yellow box. And on the side... I think on my phone, there's even a sun. (laughs) And you can move it up or you can move it down and it makes it lighter or darker, um, which is a form of compensation, uh, exposure compensation. And so it's a question of just sometimes overriding what the camera says. If you do fancy having a play around with backgrounds, you don't have to redecorate your whole room, I'm glad to say. Jackie recommends that you can buy some fancy paper from an art shop, either plain or patterned, and attach that to the reflector that she's suggested you make. And that way you can have a seamless background on which to photograph your plants against all different kinds of colours and styles. Now I can cope with making a reflector out of card and sticking some coloured paper onto it. That all sounds completely within my skill set. But I have to be honest, when it comes to cameras, I'm absolutely terrified of anything beyond the auto setting. And I wanted some reassurance from Jackie. So here she is on how to get to grips with camera technology and programming. It's quite easy to be nervous of cameras because especially when you're also on a kind of any camera, whether it's a compact, a hybrid, or a big digital SLR, um, you get into the menu and it can be really overwhelming. And I always say to people, okay, you know, do delve into the menu, but if you just get overwhelmed, half press your shutter button and you're back into camera tape mode and it's an escape button. And I think that's really good because you can take a deep breath and think, "Mm, maybe I've got to try something different or I've got to go in a bit slower or something. So don't be afraid of the equipment and experiment. Have fun. But however you use your camera, it doesn't matter, you know, whatever, whatever program, manual, auto, however, the most important thing is the eye behind it, your sense of composition and what you want to say. And it doesn't matter what camp, you know, equipment, it's, ha- it's your choice, really, of how you compose your picture. And luckily, we're all so different. When I, when I teach, um, I often get people to work in, well, not a very small area, but a reasonably small area. They're given the same projects and they all come back with completely different pictures. And we all go oh, I didn't see that and I didn't see that. So it's lovely. You know, I just love that individual approach and we've all got it. I love that advice from Jackie. Just be yourself. It's pretty much like any other part of life. You need to express your own personality through your photographs. But as Marjana points out, it takes time to develop your skills and your own style. I guess um, it's good to watch uh, to watch other um, others people work. It's good to watch uh, photos, but it, the the most important is to practice. So the more the more you practice, the faster you learn. I think um, just observe uh, your mistakes and try to find the solutions. Try to find a better angle. Try to find better light and again try again and it will be better i also i also uh, applied to myself and i also always try to improve my uh, skills and here's one final tip from jackie and some words of encouragement on your cameras there's something called a white balance button and there's various presets that you can set it for I think there's auto and cloudy day, sunny day, tungsten light, fluorescent light. It might be quite fun if you experimented with those settings. So you took one of what you normally on auto, because the camera does a wonderful job, actually. You know, it, it's brilliant. But then if you're working inside, you think, oh, I'm going to just set it to um, tungsten and see what it does to the colours. And then, then... You have it, you can compare the two shots and you think, oh, no, I like the tungsten or I like the auto. I 
quite happy with what the camera does, but then you're making an informed choice, which is always quite satisfying. But however you use your camera, it doesn't matter, you know, whether, whatever program, manual, auto, however, the most important thing is the eye behind it, your sense of composition and what you want to say. Now, the one thing we haven't actually looked at is what camera you use. Clearly, as our experts say, equipment is only one part of the equation, but it is worth having a look at what the options are. And conveniently enough, this was a question that my friend James Wong asked quite recently. Yes, I think James has a suspicion that I'm hot wiring into his brain to get topics for On The Ledge. But anyway, uh, he, he tweeted recently, so can anyone recommend a reliable, easy to use camera that instantly sends images directly to your phone? I'm looking to up my Instagram game with shots of jungles, wildlife and macro shots of houseplants. I am a clueless beginner. So lots of you came in to comment and give James suggestions. I will post a link to that thread on the show notes, but I wanted to bring you some of your suggestions. Tim Howell says you need to consider whether you actually need a separate camera. In other words, if you had another camera as well as your phone, would you use the other camera to take all your photos? If not, then the additional camera would be of little use to you. You'd carry it and then never use it. Tim says that he uses a Pentax K70 DSLR, but that's because he has a collection of Pentax lenses. He writes, if I was looking for an entry level DS DSLR, I'd look at the Nikon D3400. Cheap DSLR takes great photos. Elan Tamara says the Sony A600 is a great cam, not crazy expensive. And if you get a nice lens for it, you're all good to go. Sometimes it's cheaper to buy a really good quality analog cam lens and a converter. Ray Shilato suggests the Panasonic Lumix, which you can control from your phone, apparently. And Susie Richards agrees that Panasonics are usually good at consumer digital cameras. Sardia J has the Panasonic LX100, great quality pics, good for a range of shots, including macro, lightweight and portable. Easy to upload to any smart device via Wi-Fi and the Panasonic image app. Much better than my iPhone camera, she writes. First officer points out that you can use a phone in conjunction with an eye loop, which is a kind of close up lens to get really close up pictures, which is a really good tip. And Nicola says she got a clip on lens set for her phone from Amazon with macro lenses, which was £10 for four lenses. Tristan Tomlinson recommends the Nikon D3400, which uses Bluetooth to send photos to the phone and stores them in your iPhone gallery. That sounds handy. Josh Key writes, I saw a guy using a Google Pixel at a concert. Low light photos were incredible. Could post straight to IG from there. I'm an Apple user, so it pains me to post this. And Jono Dixon is also recommending a smartphone camera. He says, I've just got a Samsung Galaxy 9S and the camera is way, way in advance of my S7 Edge. The settings take a bit of sorting, but once I got the hang of it, it's easy and picture clarity is stunning. That's a flavour of the thread. There are loads more suggestions in there. So do go and take a look for a full summary. I hope that's whetted your appetite to improve your photograph game in 2019. If you'd like to hear more from Jackie, Philippa and Marjana, you can already find Philippa's interview on my Patreon feed for $5 or more subscribers. And I'll be putting up the interviews with Jackie and Marjana in full in the coming days. So all of you lucky Patreon subscribers will be able to hear all of their chat and advice. And remember, if you do become a Patreon subscriber, you get access to all of the back catalogue of Extra Leaf episodes, the extra episodes that I put out twice a month for my subscribers. So it's a really great deal. You also get to find out what's coming up on the show, get an insight into how the show works and what I've got planned and the occasional extra bit of merch. So my subscribers who offered their postal address should have received by now some lovely On The Ledge stickers and an On The Ledge card as my way of saying thank you to you all. That rounds up this week's show. I'll be back next Friday for a final pre-Christmas episode. Until then, folks, happy snapping. Bye.